Welcome. Uh, I'm Dane Borges, director of the Center for Latin American Studies. And uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our Latin American Briefing uh, series. This is the fourth event in our 2008-2009 Latin American Briefing series, which seeks to bring <coughs> academic specialists, policymakers, and influential political and community leaders to explore current affairs in Latin America. <coughs> For more information on the series, including a calendar of our upcoming events and an archive of audio and video from past events, I encourage you to visit our website clas.uchicago.edu. I'd also like to thank the sponsors of this event, including members of the Center for Latin American Studies Corporate Partners Program, the Motorola Foundation, New City Bank, and McDonald's Latin America. Their generous support uh, makes our uh, Latin American briefing series possible. And now, uh, let me introduce Ambassador Charles Shapiro. He's currently head of the Bureau of Western Hemisphere Affairs Task Force <coughs> for the free trade agreements with Peru, Colombia, and Panama. Uh, previously, Ambassador Shapiro was Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Department of State's Bureau of Western Hemisphere Affairs uh, from 2005 to 2007. And uh, as, as, as you know, U.S. Ambassador to Venezuela from February 2002 until August 2004. Ambassador Shapiro has a long career in the State Department. He joined it in 1977. And in addition to serving in Washington and Venezuela, he served in Chile, Trinidad, Tobago, uh, El Salvador, and Denmark. Among other honors, Ambassador Shapiro is recipient of the Presidential Meritorious Service Award in 2005 and the Chilean Orden al Merito in 2007. And I welcome uh, uh, Charles Shapiro to speak on trade in the Americas. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Very much. And I want to thank all of you for turning out on a really cold night. And so I, I appreciate that and appreciate the interest in, in Latin America. I um, also want to appreciate, thank you for lending Barack Obama to us in Washington. Um, it's nice to have him there. And Latin Americans share that uh, delight as well. They are in general delighted with the new administration, optimistic and, and looking forward to working with President Obama and Secretary Clinton. Um, a couple of things before we start. The, the make it, what I'm going to talk about are challenges for the Obama administration in the Western Hemisphere, particularly in Latin America, but also the Caribbean and Canada, um, since that's the area I cover as well. Um, Latin Americans, as most of you probably know, don't like the war in Iraq. Um, they, um, according to polling data, like it even less than American citizens do. They don't like U.S. unilateralism, and they view the war in Iraq as a manifestation of U.S. unilateralism. They don't like being a marginal player in the world. That is being ignored when decisions are being made and people are consulting about what's going on in the Middle East or what's going on in Afghanistan and Pakistan. They don't like U.S. immigration policy. And they don't like U.S.-Cuba policy. So you've got all that out there and you've got this new president coming in with this you know, sort of fabulous backstory um, that appeals to Latin Americans from from Mexico to, to Argentina, and so there's great hope and optimism. Um, let me, just a couple of things, let me just talk about uh, what the goal is, I believe, of this administration, what the goal of the last administration, in fact, what the goal of the next administration is going to be in, in the sort of most general overall terms, and that is successful liberal democracies in Latin America and the Caribbean with growing economies. And by successful, I mean successful. Successful in delivering to their citizens the benefits of good government and good governance. Um, and that's a sort of overarching uh, goal for the United States in Latin America and the Caribbean. Here's, here's what's gone well in the past decade. There's been sustained and strong economic growth. Now, varies from country to country and varies within regions of countries, but sustained and strong economic growth. And significantly, and this comes with economic growth, that is a reduction in poverty. 
Um, let me for, stop for a moment there. Poverty is the fundamental issue with which Latin Americans are grappling, and it's the fundamental issue that we need to grapple with in helping Latin America and the Caribbean. 500 million people in Latin America and the Caribbean, 190 million of whom live in poverty. Now, 10 years ago, that would have been over 200 million, so it's been going in the right direction. Um, energy, energy cooperation has been strong and important. Um, as you know, I'm sure Canada is our largest supplier of energy. Uh, not only do we buy energy from Canada, we also export energy to Canada, depending on what part of the, the, our long border you're on. Um, we import energy from Mexico, from Colombia, hopefully soon from Brazil as well. And that has been one of the things that, that has worked well in the Western Hemisphere. And I, I want to give two examples when I say things are working well. Uh, first, at, at sort of a, at the macro level, I want to talk about Chile for just a moment. It's a country that I know well. In 1990, when Patricio Elwin assumed the presidency in Chile, the first democratically elected president after 17 years of military dictatorship, the poverty rate in Chile was around 47%. In 2006, the most recent year for which we have data, that has dropped to 13.5%, somewhere around there. And by May of this year, we'll get new data. They, the, the, the National Statistical Agency does surveys and turn, comes out with the data every two years. So the 2008 data should come out in May of 2009. Um, what that has meant, for, I mean, first of all, how did Chile get there? They got there by opening their economy, by welcoming foreign, foreign investment, and by doing two things simultaneously. One is lowering all tariffs from imports from any country in the world and luring them over time uniformly while at the same time negotiating trade agreements. Chile uh, claims to be the world's champion with the number of trade agreements. They've got agreements with 57 countries around the world, either bilateral or multilateral agreements, most recently with Australia. And what that sustained growth has meant is reduction in poverty. It's meant more tax revenue for the central government which means more money that they can target at those parts of Chile and at those segments of the Chilean population that, that in particular, need assistance. Um, interestingly to me is that Chile has set aside $4 billion, which it has invested, and the interest on those investments will go to pay for graduate students to study abroad to get their PhDs um, and to study abroad in English-speaking countries in Australia, in UK, Canada, US, New Zealand. Um, Michelle Bachelet just signed an agreement actually with Arnold Schwarzenegger, the governor of California, to give Chilean doctoral students uh, preferential access to the University of California system. And they, they, they have skewed the selection process. I skewed, I don't know if that's the right word, but they've set up the selection process to favor people who have not gone to the pres most prestigious universities in Chile, to favor people who have not gone to private colegios, but have gone to public schools. And those also are people who tend not to speak English as well, and therefore the the scholarships to study abroad include time at what we would consider to be junior colleges or community colleges to learn English before going into the doctoral programs. That's terrific. That's important. It's significant and is going to um, bring long-term benefits to Chile. Now let me give you an example at the, at the micro level. That's in Guatemala. I was in Guatemala in October, late October. And I went to a cooperative called Cuatro Pinos in a town called Santiago Zacatepeque, is outside of Guatemala City. Cuatro Pinos is a marketing cooperative. They don't grow crops themselves, but they buy crops from farmers, from their own members, and they sell those crops. And what they are doing, the cooperative has got 2,000 members. I mean, it's 2,000 families that belong. 
uh, and they buy crops from another 5,000 families. Um, and what they're buying are green beans and snow peas, primarily. And they have helped turn Guatemala into the world's largest exporter of green beans. Who knew it? Um, the farmers who belong to the cooperative are indigenous Mayans. The average size of the farm that these people are, are cultivating their crops on is less than one manzana, which is six-tenths of an acre, if my math is correct. Um, these are people who previously were growing corn, were not part of the formal economy of Guatemala, were essentially subsistence farmers. Now, with the cooperative providing what we would consider to be agricultural extension services to the members, people are getting four crops a year of green beans. Um, and this is with the, the plastic on the ground and the drip irrigation. And um, they take it, there's four packing houses around the country. I visited one of them. They test for chemical uh, residues and for pathogens. Um, they select the, the, they sort the crops, they pack the crops, um, they wash them, they clean them. And if you go to, I assume you have Costco in Chicago, is that right? If you go to Costco, the green beans in Costco that say L.A. Salad Company, in fact, are from Guatemala and are produced by Cuatro Pinos. I mean, it is an extraordinary thing. And so when you go, as I had the opportunity to do, and you talk to the farmers, they said, well, our children don't get sick as often because we're using less pesticide on our crops, right? using less pesticide on our crops. Um, I've got more money than ever before, because I've got, f none of these people are getting rich, by the way, but because I've, I can produce four crops per year on my land. My children are going to school. This is an extraordinary change. In the packing houses, the tends to be the daughters and the wives of the farmers who are working in the packing houses. Um, there are computer centers set up literacy program and GED programs for the women who work there. And during, when they're not being used by the workers, they're open to the, the public schools in the, in the communities. They've also got dentists and doctors at the packing houses, both for members of the cooperative, but also, again, for the larger communities in which they're located. That's extraordinary, that's change, that's important change at the, at the micro level. So when I talk about reducing poverty in Latin America, that's what we want to do and that's what we want to help do. Um, the, the, and that's one of those themes that you will see this administration addressing is poverty, economic development. And the, the, as the president said in his inaugural address, a nation cannot prosper long when it favors only the prosperous, right? Um, the, 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 the flip side, I mean, you've got poverty and economic development. I mean, one is the, one is the, the solution to, to the other. Um, other cross-cutting theme that this administration will have to deal with is, is radical populism. Radical populism in Latin America. We can talk about it more in the question and answer period. But it is, in fact, a result of social exclusion. Social exclusion. Um, that is, across Latin America, there are people who do not participate in the national political life of their nations uh, and who do not participate in the formal economy of their nations, but rather in the informal economy, either as uh, subsistence farmers or as um, workers in the informal sectors in the, in the larger cities. Um, again, you, at the inauguration, Reverend Lowry talked about inclusion, and that's something that we need to talk about. And when you look at Latin America, and those of you who are studying Latin America know that social exclusion is worse for, is focused on, affects most um, ethnic and racial minorities across Latin America, affects women more than men, and affects rural areas more than urban areas. So that what you'll see across Latin America is you, you can improve your standard of living just by picking up and moving to the capital or to the, the major provincial centers. Um, and so Latin Americans have to deal with this. Other issues that the administration is going to have to deal with whether, whether that are important for Latin Americans are immigration. 
uh, what we perceive of as domestic policy in Latin America is seen as foreign policy. Um, so we're going to have to deal with that. We're going to have to deal with new players in the hemisphere uh, from outside the hemisphere, Russia, China, Iran. Uh, we are going to have to deal with drug trafficking in the hemisphere and I, I wish nobody had ever called it the war on drugs, but with our struggle against drugs as the most drug addicted country in the world, the United States. Um, and that means both in terms of what we're doing and helping nations do abroad, but also in terms of uh, demand reduction in the United States and drug treatment programs in the United States. And we're going to have to, there's a, a new phenomenon, uh, new to me, and that is gangs. Uh, gangs in Latin America, particularly in Central America, um, where gangs in small Central American countries uh, in some ways represent a threat to the survival of those countries. Um, it's something that we don't, you don't think about as being a foreign policy issue, but in fact it is. And that's not to say they're not gangs elsewhere. I mean, they're gangs in Brazil and they're terrible, but the gangs in Sao Paulo and Rio don't affect the survival of Brazil. Gangs in Honduras, in fact, do, because you've got gangs who are, who are better armed um, and more audacious than the, than the police of Honduras are. And overlaying all of this, overlaying all of this is the global financial crisis, all right? I mean, it's affecting us, it's affecting Latin Americans and Caribbeans, it's affecting the whole world. The IMF on the 28th of January said that they foresee one half of 1% growth worldwide in 2009, one half of 1%. Okay, that's, that's the world economy. China's going to grow at 3%. The United States will shrink, I think, uh, uh, um, go down 1.3% this year. Again, their predictions, who knows whether that will come true or not. And it is going to affect various Latin American countries. And it will, to varying degrees, it will affect those whose economies are most linked to the United States most severely. And by that, I mean Mexico, the Caribbean, Central America, Venezuela, and Colombia, because their economies are most closely tied to ours. Um, so it's going to be a very, very difficult year. We've got some, some bilateral issues we need to deal with. First, first of all, I mean, since I'm talking about Western Hemisphere, is Canada. The President's going to go to Canada on February 19th. Canada is our biggest trading partner, our closest ally, um, and is in the poor situation of having the United States as its neighbor, and I can assure you, Mexicans know this as well, the United States is not always a good neighbor, and we have issues with both Mexico and Canada that we don't have with anybody else, having to do with border crossing and pollution and water rights and who's taking how much water out of what river. Um, is sewage in Tijuana being treated, or if it's not being treated properly, it affects the beaches in San Diego. I mean, we've got all kinds of issues with our two closest neighbors that we don't have with anyone else. Um, and so the president's going to go to Canada on February 19th. Um, the president-elect met with President Calderon. He was the first foreign leader with, uh, the only foreign leader he met is during the, during the transition. And we're working on finding a date for a, a trip to Mexico. Brazil. One of the things that, in fact, has gone particularly well is we have worked really hard at and improved our relations with Brazil. Um, I'm going to tell you, I assume you all know this, but just in case you've missed it, I mean, Brazil's got 190 million people, is the world's eighth largest economy, um, is, um, got, is taking on some of the attributes that come with economic and political influence is seeking a permanent seat in the United Nations Security Council, uh, is leading the United Nations force in Haiti, um, and we need to work hard at cultivating our relationship with Brazil. We need to maintain and build upon the good relationship we have. With Mexico, we've got the Merida Initiative that we have worked with, um, 
President Calderon, that is to provide assistance to Mexican police and law enforcement to deal with narcotics trafficking coming through Mexico. Um, and it, 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 th that assistance, it also goes both ways. The Mexicans estimate that I think the number is somewhere around 2,500 weapons a day go from the United States into Mexico. 2,500 weapons a day go from the United States into Mexico. Um, we need to figure out how to stop that. Um, we've also got, obviously, drugs coming in the United States from Mexico and drug trafficking rings that have a great deal of influence in Mexico. Colombia um, has come a long way. It's got a long way to go. It is a country that is, in fact, turned around in the last 10 years. We reached an agreement in the Clinton administration with the government of Colombia and have worked together, but there's still a long way to go in Colombia. And I don't know if you saw the, the governor, one of the, a governor, a Colombian governor who'd been held by the FARC guerrillas for seven years, seven years, was released yesterday. Um, we, we need to figure out how to end that, help the Colombians end that crisis that, that has been going on in Colombia for well over 40 years. Um, we've got the carnivorous left, as some call it. You've got sort of two lefts in Latin America. You've got sort of a, a modern social democratic left in Brazil and Chile and Uruguay and Peru. And then you've got the carnivorous radical populist left. And this administration has to figure out how to deal with, with that. Cuba is a big issue. Um, and what our relationship ought to be, how we will change it, is going to be a, a, a big issue. Candidate Obama uh, talked about easing the restrictions on family travel, that is for Cuban Americans to go to Cuba to visit family members, easing the restrictions on remittances from Cuban Americans to family members in Cuba, and easing, uh, making it easier for uh, cultural, sports, uh, uh, educational exchanges between the United States and Cuba. Um, so we, we'll expect to see something happen there. And then I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about Haiti for a minute. I mean, Haiti is the most fragile situation in the Western Hemisphere. Um, it is a tragedy. It's been a tragedy for decades. Uh, it is going to be a tragedy, and we, the not we, the United States, but we, the international democratic community, need to figure out what we can do to help get Haiti moving ahead. And what, cons what concerns me is that, among other things, is that in a year where there is an economic crisis worldwide, uh, the donor nations are going, it is logical to assume, that, that money going to Haiti from the international community, whether it's from the European Union or Japan or the United, that some of that money is going to start to fall off as people are more concerned about their own economies and dealing with the unemployed people in their own countries. So we've got to, we've got to keep our eye on, on and help Haiti, which is, in fact, the poorest of the poor. Here's some dates to look out for, just some things to, as, as we look ahead. February 15th, um, 10 days from now, There'll be a referendum in Venezuela on the constitutional amendment which would remove all term restrictions in Venezuela. Um, it is, by President Chavez, his goal is to allow him to run for re-election in 2012. By the way, what, Monday was the 10th anniversary of his first inauguration. So he's been in power for 10 years will be in power till 2012, and he wants to run again in 2012. Yeah, so we'll have, we need to watch that. Uh, March 15th, there are presidential elections in El Salvador. Um, if the polls are to be believed, and I gotta put a big footnote here, I'm very skeptical of, of polling done in Ohio, let alone polling done in third world countries. If the polls are to be believed, the, the, the candidate of the FMLN, the most Left, the left most party in the Salvadoran political spectrum is at this point ahead. Um, so we need to figure out what, how we're going to, what we're going to do, how we're going to deal with the election and with whoever wins the election. 
April 17th to 19th, there will be a Summit of the Americas in Port of Spain, Trinidad, Tobago. Um, the president has not announced yet that he is going to that, but I, I assume that he will, in fact, go. Um, it is a meeting of all the presidents and prime ministers, democratically elected presidents and prime ministers of the Western Hemisphere, so it will be the first opportunity for most of his colleagues, all of his colleagues in the Western Hemisphere to meet with him. Um, so we'd, we've got to keep an eye on that. And sort of in the funny situation, since it's coming so soon, most of the planning for this summit, in fact, has been done by the administration that left office on the 20th of January. So you know, the new administration's got to look at it, see how they want to shape it and where we're going to go. And then I don't have a date for this, but I got a question mark out here, and that is the death of Fidel Castro. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you a date when he's going to die, but I can assure you that just like the rest of us, he is mortal. Um, and uh, we, need to dis we need to figure out, the administration needs to plan ahead, what will we do, what will the reaction be. I have to get, uh, you know, if this happens in Cuba, what, you know, a whole range of things that can happen there, how will we respond and what is it we're going to do. Um, on the list of issues for decision for this administration, um, one of them is, in fact, protectionism. Um, I, I, I guess this talk was billed as trade because that's what I've been talking about, although the, the new administration hasn't quite sorted out exactly what it is, what the policy is going to be on trade. But in times of economic crisis, it is normal around the world everywhere, including the United States, to turn to protectionism. Um, there is this great uh, propensity to protect the jobs you have right, to hold on to what you've got. Um, and so you see that in the stimulus package that was passed by the House of Representatives where they've got this Buy America provision in there. That is that any steel that will be used for any infrastructure projects um, funded by the stimulus package, the steel must be bought in the United States. Well. From one perspective, that makes perfect sense. But from another perspective, it, is, it, it, it uh, runs the risk that other countries, of course, will do exactly the same thing. That other countries will say, well, wait, we're not going to buy things from the United States. We're going to buy things in our country. We're going to buy Mexican-made goods or Canadian-made goods or Brazilian-made goods and not, not import. And so we've got to figure out how we're going to deal with that. The president of the, of the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas said, put it interesting. He said, let me be blunt. Protectionism is the crack cocaine of economics. It may provide a high. It's addictive, and it leads to economic death. That's great. Um, but President Obama told Fox News yesterday, he says, look, we, we can't send a protectionist measure. We've got to look at this. And you know, obviously, between a bill being passed by the House and getting it passed by the Senate and then getting the conference, uh, the two versions of the bill, we'll see what will happen. We've got to decide what we're going to do with the trade agreements that are pending. We have concluded trade agreements with Panama and Colombia. The Peru agreement was concluded, was approved by our Congress and went into force in, on January, I think, 17th, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, so it's, it's in effect, either the 17th or the 18th. Um, but we, the, we need to decide what is we're going to do with Panama and Colombia. We've got these agreements out there, and how are we going to, what are we going to do with them? How are we going to move forward on them if we want to move forward on them? Um, um, and we've got an initiative called Pathways to Prosperity, which is an initiative with all of our um, trade agreement partners in the Western Hemisphere, so it's 14, Canada to Chile, um, to try to find ways n not to pass new trade agreements, but to make the agreements we've got work better, work more efficiently, and importantly, how do we broaden the benefits of trade so it's not just major companies that are benefiting from trade. When we talk about trade issues, we, we talk about the macro economy, right? And it, which, which is wonderful, which is important. If economists are talking to each other, or bankers are talking to each other, or financiers are talking to each other, of course you're going to talk about the macro economy. We 
talk about foreign direct investment, and GDP per capita, and Gini coefficients, and all these things that I guarantee you make people's eyes just glaze over within 30 seconds. But the real issue is the, is the microeconomy, because that's where all of us as voters, that's where all of us as workers, that's where all of us live. We all live in the microeconomy, not in the macroeconomy. And what we want to know is what are these agreements going to mean for us, for our jobs, for our children, for our universities. And I think that's what we need to figure out how to do so that people understand it. And I think that we, the executive branch, we, the Congress, we, U.S. academia, U.S. NGOs, U.S. business have done, we've done a terrible job of explaining to American citizens what trade is about and how it works. Um, with that, I'm going to stop and be delighted to, to answer questions, and I hope you have a lot of them. Uh, my name is Andres, and uh, I have a question about uh, the embargo with Cuba. Mm -hmm. What is the Obama administration's stance on the embargo? Do you see uh, that there's a chance for it to be removed? Uh, I don't know. What do you have to say about this? Okay, everybody, everybody heard the question. What about the embargo? Okay, um, a couple of things I got to tell you about the embargo. Number one, it's law. Okay, it's law. So to change the embargo requires legislative change. So it's not something the president can just do, right? Um, the things that Candidate Obama, in a speech he gave in Miami, I think in June, talked about were uh, making it easier to send remittances, making family travel easier, making educational exchanges easier. That the president can do. That's policy. But the embargo is law. And so, look, we're in the, what, 12 days, 13 days of the Obama administration? I don't think they've quite worked out yet what it is they want to do. There have been a whole slew of studies by every think tank at every university in the United States, you know, about what you ought to do in Latin America and what the new administration ought to do in the Middle East and Africa and so on. And there are loads of them out there saying that we need to get rid of the embargo. Um, and there's some that say we shouldn't get rid of the embargo. And that's a decision that the new administration is going to have to wrestle with and come to decision on. Um, what the embargo says is that, that we cannot, we the United States can't sell products to Cuba except for food, agricultural products, medicine and medical products. I mean, it's, it's defined on you know, these long lists that international trade people keep. Um, we are actually the world, we, we are the number one supplier of agricultural products to Cuba. Um, we sell, I think, $450 million in 2008 uh, to Cuba. Um, you, you can't go to Cuba for tourism purposes because you would be spending money in Cuba. You'd be trading with Cuba. It's against the law. You can, as a student, however, go to Cuba on an educational exchange. You could go study at a university in Cuba, right? Um, reporters, researchers, academics, and um, clerics, not just clerics, but broadly defined, people who are working with their co-religionists in Cuba can go to Cuba. It's complicated, and to change it would require a change in law. And the administration is going to say, A, do they want to do it? And B, if they do want to do it, do they, do they want to, you know, what, how soon? I mean, what's the priority on that um, with all the other priorities the administration's got? What candidate Obama said in June was that he wanted to keep the embargo for now because he thought that it gave some leverage to, to put pressure on the government of Cuba. So we'll, we'll see how they come out. Do I believe what? That uh, it actually does work in adding pressure to it. It makes it much more difficult economically for the government of Cuba. That, that is for sure. That is for sure. Now, so now, is that pressure they will respond to or not? And is it good? Is it bad? I, you know, those are all the things that, those are political decisions, and there's loads of people who got loads of views on that. I got loads of questions. I'm Danielle. Hi, Daniel. Um, so, uh, candidate Obama talked about um, the issue of labor unionists in Colombia mm -hmm. um, in relation to the free trade agreement. Um, so, I just have a question a little bit beyond that in terms of extrajudicial executions in Colombia, um, people who have been dressed up as false positives to mm -hmm. show that numbers are going up for the military. What is the State Department and the administration's response to that growing issue? It's, it's horrible. 
and that the government of Colombia needs to address it. And in fact, the government of Colombia appears to be addressing it. Are they addressing it as quickly as they should and as thoroughly as they should? I, I can't give you an answer to that. Um, let, me, let me tell you what, what, what she was talking about in case any of you don't, aren't following this issue. And that is that starting, I think probably back in September, there started to be evidence that Colombian military units were um, luring unemployed young men from cities, uh, killing them, putting them in guerrilla uniforms, and then claiming that you know, their unit was effective because it had uh, killed more guerrillas in combat. Um, to the government of Colombia's credit, it, when faced with that information, they investigated and they, they fired a whole bunch of officers. And then it turns out that it was more widespread than they thought, and that's what they're dealing with right now. And they fired more officers and are turning people over to civilian courts. Yeah, it's a real issue. It's a serious issue, and it's one that needs to be dealt with and dealt with forthrightly. And just um, g given, given that issue, is that coming into play in terms of um, like concerns about passing a free trade agreement this year and also in terms of um, continuing high levels of military aid to the country? Or does that play a role in how it's evaluated? Um, I, again, we're 13, 14 days into the new administration. I, I can tell you that for the career bureaucrats, those of us who are, you know, stay and work on these issues, it's a real issue and it's one we have to deal with. Um, in terms of making the decision whether or not to proceed with a trade agreement, that, that decision has not been made, okay? Uh, it's logical, it makes sense to me, and I can tell you why. But at the policy levels of administration, they have to, they have to make that decision. They want to do it or they not. Um, I'm, I'm a career person. Uh, my job is to, 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 to give the advice and then follow the instructions, right? Um, I, th I think it makes good sense to do it. It makes good sense for Columbia. It makes good sense for the United States. Um, but what, one of the things that I've learned in the, in the job I've had for the past 15 months is you can't pass a trade agreement in a year that you can divide by two, right? You can't pass it through our Congress in an election year. It just is flat out impossible. And particularly in a year that you can divide by four, in presidential election year. And what happened this year is, to my way of thinking, this year in 2008, pardon me, is the elections are polarizing, right? I mean, you're either, you vote for this candidate or you vote for that candidate. That's sort of definition of polarization. I mean, and what's happened is I think it, it forces both sides of an argument to take that argument to the extreme as opposed to find some place in the middle. So I think we need to sit down carefully. We, the administration, sit down carefully, figure out is this something we want to do, talk with U.S. unions, talk with U.S. human rights groups, talk with U.S. business, and figure out how, how do we, what do we do? How, how do we move ahead? Do we want to move ahead? I'll tell you this, though. Right now, Colombian products enter the United States duty-free, right? Let me say, Colombian products under the, the, the Andean Trade Preferences Act enter the United States duty-free, as do products from uh, Peru, uh, Bolivia, and Ecuador, okay? They enter the United States duty-free. Um, U.S. products pay duties going into their country. Everybody knows what tariffs are, right? Right? Yes? Oh, okay. Pay tariffs going into their countries. Um, economists estimate that if, if this agreement were to go into effect, that U.S. exports to Colombia would increase by probably $1.2 billion a year. Okay? Um, Colombian economy, by the way, is doing very well, as is the Peruvian economy and the Brazilian economy and Mexican. I mean, it's doing well. It's expanding, and it's buying things from abroad. Um, strikes me two things. Number one, we, we want to allow U.S. workers to sell their products, right? Particularly in a year when we're having economic crisis in the United States. We want U.S. workers to make it easier to sell our products abroad. Um, at the same time, I'm convinced that these agreements actually improve human rights as opposed to hurting human rights. And they help labor rights and they help environmental um, meet international environmental standards. 
because they're part of the agreement and they become part of the bilateral conversation between the two countries, I mean, formally. Um, I think that's useful. I think that's useful. And, but we've got to decide, do, do we want to do it? Is there support in the United States to move ahead with this or not? Um, and what is it that we ought to do to help Colombia improve its human rights performance? To help its human rights performance, okay? Hi, my name is Leila. I'm sorry, tell me your name. Leila. Leila. Yes. Uh, my question regards both the protectionism you mentioned and the existing global financial crisis. What should countries whose economies are intrinsically linked to the United States or who depend on the United States do about this? Where should they seek to find new trade agreements or what can they do to um, lessen yeah, the yeah, that's burden? A, that's a great question. I mean, what do you do if you're a, a, a country that's linked to the United States? If you take Mexico, for example. I mean, Mexico's economy is supposed to shrink by, I, the, the IMF, I think, said 0.3% uh, this year. Okay, well, in a country that's got a lot of poor people, that has a direct and immediate impact. Um, and, and so how do you, what do you, what do you do when you're a nation? Well, what you need to do and what Latin American countries are doing is most of them have also uh, got their own stimulus packages, building infrastructure, building schools, doing things that will help create jobs in their countries. Um, over the longer term, what countries need to do is diversify their economies, diversify their trading partners, right? Um, and work on infrastructure and work on, in particular, uh, education. Um, you know, Mexico has been unable to take full advantage of NAFTA because of problems within Mexico of infrastructure, lack of infrastructure, particularly the further south you go, and uh, problems of education in Mexico. I mean, they need to focus on it. Um, problems more acute when you go to small Central American countries that you know, only export a certain number of products and becomes much more difficult. Um, for countries like Jamaica, it's even more difficult. Um, so this is going to be a tough year. It's going to be a really tough year, and it means that um, Nations will go to the International, uh, excuse me, Inter-American Development Bank, the International Monetary Fund, seeking loans to help them get through this year. Um, the economists predict growth in 2010, but you got to get to 2010, right? You got to get there, and so there's going to, it's going to be, it's going to be real, real dicey. I think, very difficult. No, nope, that's not a good answer. I mean, within the same context, what is your opinion on uh, the Alba? which is an alternative that Venezuela has mm -hmm. been proposing for countries in... in uh, ALBA is the, uh, the, the, Bolivarian the, the, the Bolivarian trade agreement. The countries that belong to it, help me out here, are Dominica in the Caribbean, Venezuela, Cuba, Bolivia, Nicaragua, Nicaragua and Ecuador. I can't remember if they, in the end, if they joined it. They, they were going to join, but they didn't. They're like observers. I, if it works, fine. I don't see any trade flowing as a result of Alba. I, you know, there's, it's sort of an operant definition. I mean, look, w w one of the things that we need to focus on is countries are trading with each other. You know, we have this sense in the United States, you know, just like everybody else, we think we're the center of the universe. We think everybody's dying to trade with us, and all they want to do is trade with us. In fact, they do want to trade with us, but they also want to trade with the Europeans, they want to trade with the Chinese, the Indians, the, each other. You know, Mercosur is terrific. CARICOM is terrific. The, the whatever bilateral trade packs. And I had uh, this young woman who works part time for me. She's a graduate student at Georgetown. Knows how to do this. Do slides that overlaid. You know, who's got trade agreements with whom? And it turned out to be such a jumble. It wasn't. You know, it looked like a bowl of spaghetti turned upside down on a, on a map of the Western Hemisphere. I mean, because you can just go on and on and on between bilateral agreements and multilateral agreements. The, 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 the Peruvians are negotiating with the Chinese, for goodness sakes. Europeans, uh, the Mexicans have a free trade agreement with the European Union. Um, Peru and Colombia are negotiating with the European Union. Col Colombia's got an agreement with Canada. Okay, so U.S. farmers will be at a disadvantage relative to Canadian farmers to sell stuff to Colombia. I mean, that, those are the sorts of, that's the real world of, of business and of trade. And um, 
If ALBA works, I think that's fine. I don't see any evidence that it's working. Well, the ideology is their ideology. I mean, it's ideology I don't believe in. But if, if they believe in it, that's fine. You know, I mean, I think, I, look, it's the ideology of state enterprise and state intervention in the economy, right? Well, we've just intervened in our economy, too, right? You know, but uh, state enterprise, I, you know, if it works, great. But what economic growth in Venezuela and Bolivia and Ecuador have been based on is boom in commodity prices, right? Commodity prices are down. Um, so what are, they, what are you going to do now? Uh, Venezuela this year is supposed to have 45% inflation. 45% inflation, had 30% last year. Inflation is a tax on the poorest people. Inflation is a tax on the poor. The wealthy have got bank accounts outside the country. You know, but for people who've got to go and buy things every day, not every week, but every day at the Mercado, that's a tax that is a killer. 45% inflation in Venezuela this year. Wow, that's tough, that's tough. I was wondering what you think about this. If Nixon did not pay attention to opening trade with China and all that money and all that investor was diverted to our South American brothers, where do you think our situation would be now vis-a-vis -vis Latin America? Huh. Uh, well, now there's a hypothetical I'm not sure I can deal with. Look, here, here's the deal is Countries are competing with each other. It's a, it's a constant beauty contest. I mean, uh, Colin Powell used to say, you know, uh, 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 money's a coward, right? People, money goes where they think they can get returns on investment. That, that's what you do with your money, and that's what, what businesses do with their money. Um, Latin America, until this year, has received an average of $13 billion a year of direct investment from the United States. $2 billion of bilateral assistance, $45 billion last year in remittances just from the United States, $45 billion in remittances to Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, investors make that decision. Is, are, are they going to get a better return on investment investing in Singapore or investing in, in Mexico? And, you know, we can't direct that. Um, that's one of the things that you try to do with trade agreements because they're First of all, trade agreements aren't just trade agreements. They deal with a whole gamut of issues, including investments. Um, but money's going to go where people think that money will get the best return. Um, and so there's a, there's a, a sort of a sub-genre of books and studies about, and people got, just saw in Washington, somebody's giving a, a seminar on, you know, why Latin America lags behind, you know, or, or East, you know, behind Eastern Europe and East Asia, which have grown so well over the past 20 years relative to Latin America. And it's a real issue that Latin Americans need, need to deal with. Andres Oppenheimer did a, a great book. Yeah, I, mean, I was trying to think, what's it called in English? It just came out last year, and he translated from Spanish into English. And it's terrific. It's worth reading. And he talks about, you know, he, he, so he goes to China, goes to Ireland, goes to Poland and the Czech Republic, and goes to Argentina, Chile, Mexico, and I can't remember where else, and essentially meets with the same officials in each country. And um, it, it was sort of interesting, because he said in the countries that are doing well, um, government officials tend to be pragmatic and forward-looking. In the countries that aren't doing well, officials tend to be ideological and focused on the past, right? I mean, and that's an orient. That, that, that he diagnoses. It's a, it's a great book. It's a great, it's a great book. Maria, nice to meet you. Um, you spoke briefly about uh, migration, about drugs, and about maras um, as different issues. And there's a sense that these are very closely re related. And they have some linkages to what's you know, been dealt with here in the United States, especially in terms of urban violence, uh, most specifically in L.A., uh, because these maras, because these gangs have all these linkages between sure. them. Um, the gangs in Guatemala and El Salvador are oftentimes the children of those that have migrated to the United States and these broken families result in all this youth unemployment, mm -hmm. people that receive money from abroad. Um, I was just wondering if the re administration recognizes that, that it's not 
three different issues that they have to grapple with three different policies, but that it's, you know, the symptoms of a very, uh, of one common issue, first of all. And the second question I want to ask is on the policy of these forced uh, deportations and the criminalization of migration. Um, if the policy was going to continue um, in the sense that they identify illegal um, aliens, as they call them here in the United States, as criminals, and they are either jailed or sent back. I was just wondering if, you know, I know you said 13 days. I, it's I, not can't, I, can't, I can't answer that. Do, do people realize that these issues are interconnected? Of course they do. Of course they do. Look, I, I, I live in northern Virginia where the same matters where I live are operating in El Salvador, right? And there's a flow of people back and forth between El Salvador and northern Virginia. Um, yeah, you know, in immigration issues, you bet we understand it. Narcotics, drugs issues, of course we understand it. There was hearings today, the Engel, Chairman Engel of the House Western Hemisphere Affairs Subcommittee of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, okay? Long title, but the, the people in the House that do Western Hemisphere. Um, and Cynthia McClintock, who's a professor at George Washington, if I'm not mistaken, was one of the people that testified. And she said, well, we need to legalize cocaine in the United States because of the destruction that it is uh, wreaking in, in, in Latin America, in the source countries, Bolivia, Peru, Colombia, but the transit countries in the Caribbean, Central America, and Mexico. She was almost laughed out of there by the congressman holding the hearing, right? I mean, I, I don't think... I don't see it, certainly not in my, the, the few years left in my, my career, but I bet you in your working career, I don't see drugs being legalized in the United States. I mean, it's a, it's a political decision, right? Um, and again, we look at immigration as a domestic issue, right? I mean, I, I don't know where each of you, where your hometowns are, but it really is a domestic issue in the United States um, where people feel to some degree correctly, that you know, my property taxes are going up to in little towns that have never that haven't had immigration in decades to help um, pay for ESL teachers. My wife's an ESL teacher, by the way. Um, pay for ESL teachers and find bilingual policemen and social workers and, and deal with hospital admissions. Well, that's a fact. I mean, you know, people's. Property taxes are going up, and people really care about that. Um, on the other hand, we've got this tremendous demand for, for, for manpower in the United States. How do you square those things, and how do we deal with that? And how, you know, do you just say, well, anybody who can get across the border stays? I, I, it is a really, um, a, I mean, um, um, people say it's the, one of the third rail issues of U.S. domestic politics. President Bush, to his credit, tried to get immigration reform through the Congress. Uh, his own party would not support him, right? His own party would not support him. Um, we'll, we'll see what happens. The, the other thing, I mean, sort of talking about immigration for a second, that I hear when I travel through Latin America, and I go to countries like Panama, that I don't know that there are any Panamanians in the United States illegally. I mean, you know, it's not a... But when I met with Panamanian editors of newspapers and magazines, they were, how could you do this? This is horrible what, you're, what you guys are doing in the United States, that you're treating these people like criminals when all they're doing is seeking a better life, right? And, and I think that is a perception from Argentina to, to Mexico. You know, why are we criminalizing this? Why are we treating these people so poorly? But the, I'm not sure I can say this is, um, eloquently as I'd like to, but one of the things that's happened over the past 20 years in U.S. law enforcement is this um, concern, and, and it's not an invalid concern, that the people that you're dealing with, whether it's somebody you stop for a traffic ticket or it's an immigration officer, that the, they, those people might shoot you, right? So we put those little plastic handcuffs on people and treat them, you know, put them on those buses with the you know, the mesh on the windows and the whole thing. And we treat them because the officers are afraid for themselves, right? I, I can't tell you that's right, that's not right. But, but what it projects is that we're treating people like criminals, right? Whose crime is coming to the United States to seek work, right? We're treating people like criminals, handcuffed, kept in secure facilities, whose, whose crime is coming to the United States. You know, I was 
you know, my grandparents came to the United States when you didn't need a visa, right? Um, I, I'm glad they did. But it's, it's a really difficult issue that, that we are, and our political system is going to have to grapple with, and not, not over the short term, but it's going to be something that's not going to go away. Not going to go away. One thing you didn't discuss, or I didn't hear you discuss very prominently at the beginning, was issues of the issue of global warming and of sustainability more generally. Um, what kind of engagement is the State Department, uh, might the State Department have with the region in the run-up to Copenhagen uh, later in the year? What kind of, uh, how are they going to grapple with the issue of deforestation? And is there any talk about um, energy in, in the region, alternative energies? And then secondly, just more broadly, um, how it, it, does, do issues of sustainability play a part uh, in discussion in discussions of economic development in the State Department? Is it something that people think about? The answer is yes. Um, I mean, that's one thing that clearly has changed dramatically between this administration and the last administration is, you know, how, what are we going to do at Copenhagen? How seriously are we going to treat it? To what degree are we going to consult um, with countries, including those countries in Latin America? I'm not sure all that's defined yet, but I think you can take as a given that the answer is yes, yes, and yes. Um, what we've been doing already is working with, we, sort of interestingly, us and the Brazilians have been working together. We first chose five countries in Central America and the Caribbean, which import 100% of their energy, right? 100% of their energy. Um, the Caribbean island nations are the most energy dependent countries in the world. I mean, the, you know, the, 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 the islands are too small. The, the rivers aren't long enough to, to dam. Um, and except for Trinidad, there's, there are no hydrocarbons. Um, I guess there's sun and wind, but they're not, certainly not taking advantage of them. And so but what we have been doing is working with the Brazilians on ethanol to, to deal, to help people develop their own domestic ethanol capacity using sugarcane um, for the most part. Um, and it's worked so well that then we've expanded it and chosen the additional countries that we're working together with. You know, um, we actually produce more ethanol than Brazil does, but Brazil, it's a larger percentage of its total energy consumption comes from ethanol. Um, and they're very good at it and done, they've done a terrific job. And so we're trying to work with them to transfer some of that know-how uh, to Latin American Caribbean countries. And I expect to see more of that. And yeah, you bet we talk about deforestation and we talk about those issues with our Latin American colleagues. But one of the things that I think also has to change, and this is not a, a Republican or Democratic issue, but a, a sort of an issue of um, con conception of the world. I mean, we're very good at consulting with Latin American countries about Latin American issues, right? But we don't, by and large, consult with Latin American countries about the Middle East or about Iran or about North Korea, or about global warming. I mean, issues that are not Latin America-specific issues. Um, that has started to change, by the way. Um, so when we, when we meet with the Brazilians, when we meet with the Chileans, when we meet with the Mexicans, we talk about you know, the, the whole world. But, but you know, we always, if some big initiative's coming up, we always consult with the, the whatever countries, the president of the EU, we consult with the French and the Germans. You know, we don't always go and consult with Mexico and Brazil, and we ought to. And one of the interesting things that's come out of this financial crisis is this G20 group, which Brazil, Mexico, and Argentina are, are part of, um, that met in London and will meet again in London in April, if I'm not mistaken. And I think that's interesting, because it, it is Latin American countries being involved in the global stage. And I think we will see more of that in this administration. I think it's important.